Good afternoon. It is the 17th of April 2014. Many thanks for joining us on Ebru Africa News. I am Annette Akisa. We'll jump straight into it where human rights groups in Kenya are urging the government to hasten the process of screening those arrested in the ongoing security operation. There has been widespread condemnation over the handling of the detainees, but the government insists they are being held in proper conditions. Some 225 foreigners who have so far been arrested in the ongoing security operation in Nairobi are to be deported as part of the crackdown on terrorism. Sam Gakunyi with the details. Human rights activists drawn from 17 organizations are now calling on the government to bring to an end the ongoing operation at the Kasarani Stadium and allow independent monitors to the screening center as well as investigate all claims of human rights violations and corruption made against security officers by those arrested. A national conference be con convened that will bring about an inclusive conversation about how to manage the problem of terrorism which the country is currently facing. We do not feel that uh, falling back on, on uh, old methods which are very reminiscent of, uh, of the colonial approach is, is the appropriate step to take. The civil society while condemning terrorist attacks that have left hundreds dead and many others injured are raising several issues on how the operation of Salamu Watch is being conducted. Uh, that uh, terrorism is not a preserve of Muslims and that the religion of Islam itself does not countenance or support terrorism. The human rights community also says that claims of ethnic profiling is likely to adversely affect those who are innocent. And, and, uh, and that uh, all distinctions that favor or disfavor uh, uh, certain individuals on the basis of, of uh, various dividing lines uh, or various diversities are wrong. And uh, that is as enshrined in Chapter 4 of, of our Constitution, our Bill of Rights. Meanwhile, the operation to weed out aliens in the country moved to South Sea area, where police arrested 34 suspected illegal immigrants. After such arrest, human rights activists claim that there have been cases of those arrested losing contact with their family members, leading to unnecessary anxiety about their safety and whereabouts. Life procedures, persons held by the police have access to relatives and legal representation. In the case of the Kasarani operation, these have been denied, leading to much opacity around the operation. The government says the security operation will go on. Judges will decide Thursday whether Karim Wade, the son of the former Senegalese president Abdullah Wade, will stand trial on corruption charges after accumulating a fortune worth more than $1 billion. Wade appeared before the West African nation's top anti-corruption prosecutor on Friday to justify his income against accusations of illegal wealth. A smiling Karim Mwade made no comment as he arrived at the Dakar offices of Alion Dao, special prosecutor of the anti-corruption court, who has given the politician 30 days to justify his past and present income. Security officers were forced to use tear gas to disperse angry supporters of the former ruling Senegalese Democratic Party PDS who shouted free Karim in front of the court. The supporters responded by throwing stones to the officers. The PDS accuses the regime of Maki Sal, who defeated Wade's father in presidential elections last year, of conducting a witch hunt since it came to power. Though this is the first time Wade Jr. is being questioned by the special prosecutor of the anti-corruption court, several leaders of the 2000 to 2012 Wade regime have been repeatedly questioned by police and judges investigating allegations of illegal enrichment. According to a judicial source, the 44-year-old is also under investigation in France following a complaint by the Senegalese government for the alleged embezzlement of public funds, misuse of corporate assets and corruption.
Moving on, despite the ongoing violence sparked by the election period, Algerian youths remain optimistic that their country will get better in time. More and more of them are now returning home, lured by the government financial enticements after fleeing from the war-torn country in the 1990s. One of the biggest problems facing Algeria's politicians is how to improve the prospects for the country's disaffected youth. With unemployment for the under 35s running at almost 22 percent, the young are desperate for change. There is no freedom of expression, no work, there is nothing. I do not know how they run the country, but they do nothing. There are no safety nets for youth. There is no safety net for the Algerian society, nothing. They do not give you a chance. This is a big prison. In the 1990s, young people in Algeria fled the violence ravaging their country. But more and more are returning, the government offering up to 100,000 euro loans to those looking to set up small and medium-sized businesses. Nassim Awidia is one of more than 300,000 young Algerians to have taken advantage of this scheme since 2008. The entrepreneur set up a small factory making tools that employs seven people. I had the opportunity to go to Canada. I was approached by friends who were in Canada because I had a profile that was wanted. But I told myself that I had the opportunity to succeed here, in Algeria, so I look elsewhere. The authorities decided to extend the program to Algerians living abroad, but inside the country, social unrest continues. We do not let the young think for themselves, so they keep their place. I think the state should definitely allow associations, civil movements, let them express themselves. A stronger civil society is a more democratic and free state. Critics of the scheme accuse the government of using it to boost its image among the youth, as President Abdelaziz Bouteflika stands for a controversial fourth term. Meanwhile, boatloads of illegal immigrants continue to set off from Algerian shores for Europe in search of a better life. Now, Oscar Pistorius' defense suffered a huge blow Wednesday after the prosecution challenged the credibility of a defense witness. Roger Dixon, a geologist at the University of Pretoria and a former policeman, was accused of being unqualified to testify as an expert witness as he challenged the state's murder case against the athlete. The prosecution in the Oscar Pistorius murder trial challenged the credibility of a defense witness on Wednesday. Prosecutor Jerry Nell scrutinized testimony given by this man, geologist Roger Dixon. Are you a sound expert, sir? Dixon had told the court he did audio tests to check if the sound of a bat hitting a locked door could sound much like a bullet being fired. Pistorius is charged with shooting dead his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, last year from behind a bathroom door in his Pretoria home. Neighbors have testified hearing gunshots that night, but the defense says it was the former track star swinging a bat at the door to reach his shot girlfriend. What, what, what expert skills did you use? I made wielding a bat. sound. So your expertise was wielding a bat? Dixon also gave testimony on visibility during the shooting, but Nell put that too under scrutiny, suggesting the witness wasn't expertly qualified to make such testimony. Your analysis of visibility in the dark, did that require any expert skill? Um, my lady, the instruments I used there were my eyes. But the defense, too, pushed back on Wednesday. It said the prosecution's theory that Steenkamp was behind the door when the first of four bullets struck just couldn't be true. Defense attorney Barry Rue suggested the prosecution's theory requires a magic bullet. Can it go from F to the back of the deceased by changing direction from downwards to upwards and then go up and back into the toilet? My lady, not in the world that I live in. It's, it's, I won't say it's improbable, I say it's impossible. <coughs> Logically, it, it cannot happen. Pistorius insists the shooting was an accident and that he thought Steenkamp was an intruder. He faces life in prison if convicted of murder. The trial continues on Thursday before taking a short break for Easter.
And elsewhere, the New York Yankees commemorated the late Nelson Mandela, the first black president of South Africa, with a plaque in legendary Monument Park yesterday as part of their Jackie Robinson Day festivities. Interesting to see him work with Pineda tonight, see if they can get going. Mandela's grandson, Zondwa Mandela, and Jackie Robinson's widow, Rachel, unveiled the plaque that hangs next to the tribute to Jackie Robinson, the first player to break the color barrier in baseball. The ceremony was pushed back a day after rain and snow postponed the Yankees' first game against the Chicago Cubs. Possible until it's done. End quote. The beloved anti-apartheid activist known as Madiba traveled to the United States on his first international trip just four months after completing a 27-year prison sentence under the South African apartheid regime in 1990. Again, Nelson Mandela being honored tonight. Mandela was fitted at his first stop in New York as thousands flooded the streets to see him and watch the ticker tape parade. Peter wearing the number 42, all Yankees and Cubs will do that tonight, Jack. They were not Later, as President Mandela would famously use sports to usher in a period of reconciliation in South Africa. But will they wear the 42? Will they wear the 42? In the as the last of the fires are put out, Chilean firefighters have released an exclusive footage showing the full extent of the blaze. At least 13 people died in the fire that destroyed over 2,000 houses in the Chilean port city of Valparaiso. Chilean firefighters release exclusive footage of deadly forest fires in Valparaiso, which killed at least 15 people and destroyed 2,000 homes over the weekend. The fire started Saturday and rampaged through forests and residential neighborhoods. It was a harrowing experience for those on the scene. For us, it was an experience that affected us tremendously. On the one hand, we felt happiness for helping and had saved many lives. But on the other hand, we felt a tremendous frustration at not being able to do much more. Chileans are grappling with this, the second big disaster in just two weeks after a massive 8.2 magnitude quake slammed into northern Chile April 1st. Crossing borders now, India kicks off the biggest day of its mammoth general election with a quarter of its 815 million voters set to head towards the polls in states ranging from the disputed Himalayan region of Jammu and Kashmir to the densely populated plains of Uttar Pradesh and the IT hub of Bangalore in southern Karnataka. From the strife to northeast to the Silicon Valley of Bangalore in the south, 12 states go to the polls on the busiest day of the general elections. Security has been beefed up and paramilitary forces have been deployed as voting begins in some of the most threatened states, including the militancy-affected Jammu and Kashmir, recently riot-hit state of Uttar Pradesh, the Maoist-inflicted states and the Northeast. We have made elaborate security arrangements, keeping in mind all aspects, sensitivity and uh, critical analysis of all polling stations. Deployment has been made as per the guidelines of Election Commission of India. The election has turned into a face off between Rahul Gandhi, best known for his famous last name, Nahendra Modi, who has been lauded by Indian corporate leaders and foreign companies for his business-friendly policies and his Gujarat model. The ruling Congress party led by Nehu Gandhi dynasty and its allies were focused to win just 111 parliamentary seats in the polls. Congress faces a struggle to be re-elected after a decade in power due to public anger over economic slowdown, high inflation and a string of corruption scandals. Indian elections are notoriously hard to predict due to the country's diverse electoral and a parliamentary system in which local candidates hold great sway. A first-time voter, Arun, urged all voters to exercise their franchise. I have come for the first time to cast my vote, and since it's my first time, I would like to appeal to everyone that they should cast their vote as well, for it is good for our future. We have to bring the government of our choice to power.
Modi, chief minister of Western State of Gujarat, has been wooing voters by promising to get India out of its slowest economic growth in a decade and by pointing out his track record of cutting red tape and attracting investment in his state. Gandhi faces an uphill battle to keep the Congress party in power in an election where his main rival, the Hindu nationalist Modi, seems to be riding a popularity wave. Voting in the world's most populous democracy where about 815 million people are expected to cast their votes is phased over several weeks, ending on May the 12th. Results are due to be announced on May the 16th. <laughs> Now, grey water has for a long time been viewed as waste that should be disposed of the very minute one is done cleaning. But unknown to many, homeowners can save thousands of gallons per year with a pool of a lever. Take a look. Looking to save money and be a little more environmentally conscious? Take a cue from Yuri Chung and do your laundry. Chung is one of the small but growing number of Californians saving thousands of dollars each year with a gray water filtration system, which recycles water from the wash and uses it to water fruit trees in her backyard. It's not only making her property green, it's also putting green in her pockets, and best of all, she says, is that it's user friendly. I think the most important thing is to make it easy for people. Like I understand that there's a cost you know, involved with installing the system, but the reason why sprinklers just go off all the time is because they're set on a timer and no one wants to actually be manually changing that timer all the time. That's where Lee Girard comes in. He's in the business of making it easy to reuse dirty water by installing highly efficient systems that are low maintenance. A gently used water doesn't have to go into the sewer system where additional chemicals, additional energy is added to it, you know, oxygenation, settling tanks, and it's flushed out into the Santa Monica Bay where it can create more problems. It's much better to put that water into the water table where it'll percolate down and become part of our um, aquifer. Gray water is any non-potable water that doesn't contain human waste and can be reused to irrigate vegetation. It can't contain contaminants or large quantities of salt that would kill plants and vegetables. Gerard says users would save tens of thousands of gallons of water per year and users in California would be helping the state out too after it suffered its driest year on record. We're doing really well. The phone's been ringing off the hook. Um, because of the drought, people are starting to become intensely aware of water shortage, where our water comes from, and how expensive it is. So I've been getting a lot of calls. There's just one small requirement. You can only use natural-based soaps and detergents. But what are a few suds when you could save a whole lot of green? Well, that story wraps up our bulletin this afternoon, but be sure to join me at 9 p.m. for a more comprehensive bulletin on what's happening in our world. I am Annette Akisa. Enjoy your afternoon. Does your exterior complement your interior? Everyone needs a home that is inspired by nature. At Yenbo Limited, we offer durable, energy-efficient and affordable UPVC windows in attractive colors. Visit us at Wall Street Business Park of Mombasa Road. Yenbo UPVC windows. Your desire, our child. Professional makeup.